Hello, I'm Cara Dahl Russell out in the vicissitudes of a late March day in 2022. The pre-concert lecture that I'm going to be sharing with you right now was originally presented in 2018 in April for the Mid-Atlantic Symphony Orchestra. I'm going to be speaking about Symphony Number no. 4, the music of Gustav Mahler, who lived from 1860 to 1911. Now, when I talk about a program before the actual orchestral program, I'm looking for links between the music. And the pieces on the program that day gave me the opportunity to talk about the symbiosis between the technical work of a musician and the emotional life of the musician. Intellect, heart, sense, and sensibility. The entire second half of the program that day was made up with a major orchestral work by Gustav Mahler, now recognized as one of the greatest composers of all time. And I say now recognized because at the time he composed this symphony, not only was the jury still out on his capacity as a composer, he himself was still doubtful. This symphony is the last of a group before his life changed and his work changed. As he wrote this, Mahler still thought of himself as a bit of a musical hack. During his lifetime, Gustav Mahler was known as a conductor who did some composing, and at least initially, not very successfully. He was another of the precocious child musicians. He wrote his first composition at six and was allowed, as a child, to join his town's men's band. He entered conservatory as a pianist and played percussion in the symphony, but his studies focused mainly on composition and conducting. At 20, he took his first professional conducting job at the spa town of Bad Hall. Then, six months in Slovenia, followed by a stint as a choral master for a theater in Vienna. And he had many short gigs as a conductor, musical director, and choral director around the age of 23 in Moravia and Kassel, where Hans von Bülow conducted a visiting orchestra. And Mahler applied to him for a new position. From this, he became assistant conductor in Prague for four years and then in Leipzig for two years as the court conductor in Budapest. These short stints were due to multiple factors. Throughout his career, he often experienced anti-Semitism from the people doing the hiring and from the musicians that he was conducting. He said, quote, I am thrice homeless as a native of Bohemia in Austria, as an Austrian among Germans, and as a Jew throughout the world. Everywhere an intruder, never welcomed, unquote. To complete the picture, Mahler's perfectionism and prickly personality didn't help him, and his musical ideals often made him feel that the productions he was conducting were beneath at least his goals, if not beneath his talents. His depression didn't help, and his health certainly didn't help. He was known to be someone who regularly suffered from hemorrhoids, from migraines, and what at the time they called a septic throat. And now, all of this, he's at the age of 28. For several years, he had been working on his songs and airs, settings of the works of various poets. Probably due in part to all of his choral direction, Mahler is now known as one of the best composers of song settings for voice and orchestra. At 28, he was introduced to a group of folk poems, Das Knaben Wunderhorn, Youth Magic Horn which became tremendously influential and the basis of his inspiration. He had made rough sketches 
towards his first symphony, but orchestral settings of these songs took primacy in his work. So while the settings of these poems became inspirational, he also felt a little trapped by them. An obsession can be both thrilling and debilitating and controlling. When his first and second symphonies were met with critical disappointment, quote, Mahler is a first-rate conductor, but under no circumstances should he consider himself a composer. And Mahler was inclined to agree with them. He wrote to a friend that since he had nothing of significance to say as a composer, he would devote himself to being a retread artist, building symphonies on the settings of the Wunderhorn songs. His first four symphonies all have a movement or significant motifs built around one of these previous youth's magic horn song settings. In hindsight, now we know these to be a set of works from a specific time period of his life when this poetry held him in its sway and had pervasive influence over all of his work. With our emotional intelligence, we can also see that these poems of an idealized youth probably helped him work through some aspects of his own childhood. A childhood which included poverty, being sent away to school at 11, and the death of several of his siblings. The one we will hear today, Symphony No. 4, the last of the Wunderhorn symphonies, is said by musicologist Robert Greenberg to be a child's innocent view of life. This innocent view takes us through life with its trials and its fears, and finally to a peaceful heaven without having to go through death. Many call this symphony, quote, entry-level Mahler, unquote. It is one of his most classically structured, classical in the sense of intended to please and easy to understand, it is one of his shortest symphonies, and it does not have the heavy philosophy or morbid themes of his later works. It's, importantly, also very lyrical. It makes us an even more complex work, easier to enjoy when it's filled with melody. Uh, Apologies for all the, the gaps in, in this particular video. I'm having some technical trouble advancing my text. So you will want to listen in this symphony, especially for the final movement, when a soprano joins the orchestra. Instead of the big rousing finish that many orchestral works have and what we often have come to expect, the closing of this work has been referred to as disappointing but you need to remember that this is a child's eye view of tranquility and of a peaceful heaven. So instead of Beethoven's bombastic ode to joy, we close with something Mahler found even more elusive, calm contentment. Enjoy symphony number four, by Gustav Mahler. I'm Cara Dahl Russell. Thank you for joining me and my cat again. <laughs>